So last week we talked about baptism in general. This week I want to talk about the effects of baptism. Now, um, all sacraments give sanctifying grace. And I talk a lot about sanctifying grace. I had a really long class on that, a little over an hour. Um, if you want to know which one it was, I want to think it was... Um, you can find the video on, on YouTube if you look. Um, I don't know if I called it grace or superheroes or something like that, but it was about sanctified grace and what it does for you. I mean, sanctifying grace is the most amazing thing. And yes, I could have, I had a class all on it alone. So I'm not going to go over again the, the great value that you get from sanctifying grace. That's the major thing that you get from any sacrament. But each sacrament also has its own effects. And those are the effects that I want to go over today. So um, the first thing that baptism does is it makes you a member of the church. The, be, once you become a member of the church, you now have benefits, but you also have responsibilities. So some of the benefits that you receive by being a member of the Catholic Church is, first of all, you have divine life in your soul, which is sanctifying grace. And you no longer live just a natural life, you now live a supernatural life. The two are superimposed. So the things that you do in your natural life will have benefits to your supernatural life. You can now merit. You couldn't merit before. Now things... Offering up sufferings, doing good works in this life, will now give you supernatural merit. So you have a supernatural life. Um, and again, I went through that in the Sanctifying Grace video, so I'm not going to go too much into that right now. The second, so you have divine life. You have the divine life you have is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The, the whole Trinity comes to live in you. Each of them in a different way, and each of them having different effects. So the, the first part of that is you become a son of God. You can now call God your father. You are now adopted by God. But it's not the same kind of adoption that if you as a human being were to go out and adopt a child. When you adopt that child, yes, you can give that child your name. You, that child can inherit from you. But that child has no real connection to you. There's no blood connection to you. They don't look like you. They don't have the same personality or, you know, have some of this, your personality traits that you've passed on to them. So that, but the adoption that you have by baptism does give you that. You are now connected to God. A connection even closer than the, the, the connection of blood. You are, not, you are He's dwelling in you. And we'll get into the, when we get into your connection with Jesus Christ, you are now incorporated. He's incorporated in you. You are, you are one and you are both the same. You're, you're connected. So you, um, in John, the, uh, he says, as many as received him, he gave the power of becoming sons of God. So, St. John in, in his gospel says that we become the sons of God. Is when we, when we, we accept him, we, we receive baptism, we are now the sons of God. And yes, we can now inherit heaven. Just like any other child that is adopted <laughs> receives inheritance from his parents, we can now receive our inheritance. Our destiny is heaven. Our inheritance is heaven. And we can receive that. Um, we can all... <coughs> Thank you. We can, um, so, <coughs> we, 
we share in God's divine nature. We're, we, we are his, his heir. Um, we can, no, you can't, go, you can't say you don't look like him because God created you in his image and likeness. With sanctifying grace in your soul, you do now look like him. So the adoption, this adoption is much different than, you receive all the things that, that a child would receive in a human adoption. But the, a child receiving in this divine adoption receives even more. You can, you can, the more perfect you become, the more you practice the virtues, the more like your father you will even look. So it's, um, and we also now have the right to call him father. He will look out for us as, a ch as his own child. Whatever we need, he will give to us. He will discipline us when we need to be disciplined. This is the Father's duty. This, um, so we have now have a special connection with God the Father. We also have a special connection with God the Son. We are incorporated into Christ. Christ is the church. When we become a member of the church, we become a member of Christ. We call it the, the mystical body. We are one with Christ. And that's why God can call us, we can, God can look at us and call us his sons. Because we are now his sons. When he looks at us, he doesn't see us. He sees Christ in us. He sees his son Christ. So, when we're baptized, we're grafted onto the vine, which is Christ. And we become a branch. Christ said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Um, and St. Paul said, we're baptized into one body. That body is Christ. The mystical body. He is the head and we are the members. I used to draw on the blackboard for the kids. Um, you know, a, a figure and I'm telling you, yeah, you're an elbow and you're you're the big toe. Yeah, you're now part of Christ's body. And you he will use you. He's the, he's the brain, he's the head. The blessed mother is the heart. He will use you to do what he wants done in the world if you allow him to. Just, you know, if a body wants to walk, he, he wants to go somewhere, he will use you to get, if you're his big toe, you know, to, to go someplace. And then, with the Holy Spirit, the third connection to the Divine Trinity is the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost now comes to live in you, and but he brings gifts. He brings the three theological virtues faith, hope, and charity, in a whole different way than you may have experienced them before. He also brings with him the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. He also brings the, the cardinal virtues with him. And you are connected in a special way now with these three persons of the Blessed Trinity. With the Holy Spirit sanctifying you, prompting you to do good, strengthening you with these virtues, with your incorporation in Christ, being a member of the mystical body, and being able to call God your Father, and being able to look forward to a life in heaven with him. Uh, having him be able to call on him to help you in your needs when you need something and you know look forward to reward and punishment in this life or the next whichever so this is the first thing that baptism does it makes you a member of the church and this is what making being a member of the church means that as a member of the church, there are only three ways now that you can be put out of the church. As a baptized member of the church, you can't be separated from it. But as, as with any other member, like the, you have a body and you, you, 
your finger becomes diseased, it's no longer, you can cut it off. And that can happen with members of the mystical body of Christ. They can be cut off. There's three ways to cut them off. Sin doesn't do it. You can be, you can be a serial killer. You can be the most hardened reprobate that, there, that lives. It, it, you commit mortal sin, but you can go to confession. You're, again, part of the Catholic Church. But there are three ways that you can be cut off from the church. The first is heresy. Heresy is um, when you stubbornly deny. You can deny a, a, a truth of the Catholic Church, but if you hold fast to it, you won't give it up, you're stubborn about it, then you become a heretic. If you simply, let's say, in, in some part of a conversation, you mention something that is heretical and somebody corrects you and say, oh, I didn't realize that. And it, you are not a heretic. Heretic is to hold fast to it and to not give it up. One, one dog, even if it's one book dogma of the Catholic Church, most heretics often deny more than one, but it only takes one. And what will happen normally is that then you are then called to account by someone in the church to where they explain to you this is wrong, this is heresy, you can't hold that. And if you say, well, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway, then they will, uh, a court of the church will say, then you're a heretic and you're no longer part of the church. And at that point, that's called excommunication. That's, the other, that's the, a, another way that you can be cut off. There used to be certain things that would automatically excommunicate you. Abortion was one such thing. Abortion did no longer automatically excommunicates you. I think that has been changed in church law. I'm not positive of that, but um, I think it has been. It's not automatic, but it's, again, it's a serious, very serious sin. And um, the, so, but that's not heresy. So you can be excommunicated without being a heretic. You can be excommunicated for other reasons. And uh, you can, for, for very serious sins the church can excommunicate you, of, of, of which one you, was for abortion. Um, the third way that you can be put out of the church is called schism. And, you know, that's what they say about all of us. But Schism means we refuse to acknowledge the authority of our lawful pastor, which by that they usually mean the Pope. There are certain groups you know, out there that over time have left the church, separated themselves from the church, because they wouldn't accept the authority of the Pope. Um, I'm not schismatic at this point, but with Francis, close. I'm, I'm not, it's not that I wouldn't accept the authority of the Pope, it's to the point I'm almost think, um, is he still the Pope? No. What about Benedict? Benedict? Benedict really never did the job right when he abdicated, and he knew what he was doing. Um, he only abdicated part of the job. So, what do we have? Two popes? Are we back in the time of the anti-popes where we have more than one? I don't know. I'm, I'm not going there, and I'm not worried about it at this point because I think a lot of other things are going to happen. But I see Francis is tearing down the fabric of the Catholic Church instead of building it up. If anything, he is heretical in many of the things that he says. Now, does that automatically excommunicate him the way some people want to say? No, that doesn't automatically excommunicate him. You still need that court to come forth and say, this is what you said, this is wrong, this is heretical, and then he will retract it, and then they, um, will that ever happen? Well, probably not because the court would you know, or all these cardinals and things who seem to believe the same thing he does. So, um, at this point, I'm not going there. Uh, I'm, I won't ask, answer questions on that either. So, but yes, um, schism is a, is the third way that you can be put out of the church. 
I'm just going to sit back and wait and see. I'm going to hold, I'm, <coughs> my viewpoint is I'm going to hold fast to everything the church has taught for the last 2,000 years and let them go their way and destroy themselves and go to hell and handbasket. But I'm going to hold back onto these, what the church has taught for 2,000 years, and do what I know is right and totally ignore them. Um, so, these are the th only three ways that you can be excluded from the Catholic Church. And even these ways are not totally, uh, do not totally close you off because you can repent of your heresy and gain, re gain admission to the Catholic Church. Do you have to be baptized over again? No. Still, it's, um, you can, you can acknowledge the, the authority of the Pope and leave one a, a systematic group and go back to the Catholic Church. And again, you, um, excommunications can be lifted. So these, these are not, these, once these happen does not necessarily mean that it's, it's you have no recourse. Um, you can always be, come back to the Catholic Church. Though it's it it can be hard because people who are stubbornly heretical they don't want to give it that's it becomes a matter of pride and pride is something very hard to overcome. So and uh, the next effect of baptism the first being that now you're a member of the Catholic Church the <laughs> next effect that baptism gives you it seals you with a seal. We talked about the character that certain sacraments give characters. Baptism is one. Baptism, holy orders, and confirmation. So baptism seals you with a seal. What is the seal? Well, you can look at it as a tattoo, you can look at it as a mark, a brand, something, there's a mark on you. It's invisible to everybody else, but God and the angels, saints, they all can see it. This is a permanent mark. It cannot be taken away. And as I said, when you go to heaven, it will be there to get, add to your honor and glory. When you go to hell, it will mark you that the devils, this is one we want to persecute even worse. Because they, you know, they were baptized. Um, this mark in you is what gives you the likeness to Christ. Um, it marks you as your servant and that you belong to him. You are now his. And as I say, when God the Father looks at you and he sees this mark, he looks at you and he says, this is my son. Um, the third thing that baptism does for you, it makes you fit to receive the other sacraments. You cannot receive any of the other sacraments until you have received baptism. You can't receive penance. I, know, I remember a, a friend of mine, his wife was Catholic. Her husband was close to becoming a Catholic. He liked everything, you know, but he, he, was, he was a Protestant, had been baptized Protestant. And um, he had gone, he, he, we had all gone to uh, some kind of conference that a priest gave on, and he, the priest was talking about penance, the sacrament. I want to go to I want to go to confession. So I said, you can't go to confession. You're not a Catholic. It's she said you can go in and tell the priest your sins, but the sacrament won't work for you because you're not a Catholic. But you know, fine. The, the, and that's true. The, the, you have to be baptized before you can receive any of the other sacraments. Um, now. You could kind of go the argument, well, he had baptism of desire, and um, he was not yet, you know, ha had received baptism by water, but he did have baptism of desire. So is that, could he, if he went in and went to the sacrament of penance, would that have worked? I don't know. As, uh, that's the question you ask the priest. Um, but... Um, I would say at this point, no. Um, so, 
And by the way, that will be next week's catechism lesson is baptism, the other baptisms. Um, baptism of water, we're talking about now, but next week it'll be baptism of blood and baptism of desire. Baptism of desire probably being the most confusing and, um, and yet there's, it also answers some, all those other questions that people have about, with, you know, issues with Protestantism and the whole idea of outside the Catholic Church there is no salvation. That's where all, that's all where baptism of desire comes in. So we need to spend a little bit of time on that. The fourth effect of baptism is it cancels all the sin and all temporal punishment due to sin. And most people know that it cancels away your sins. That if you're an adult, this does not work for babies though. Babies don't have any sins. But if you're an adult and you become baptized, from the moment that you are baptized, you are as white as snow, as perfect as the, as the day that Adam was created. No sin and no temporal punishment. The temporal punishment, if you remember, was way back in the beginning, one of the first lessons. Temporal punishment is the punishment <coughs> that, you, that you gain for yourself because you've done something wrong. For example, I gave the example, you steal money, and I, I'm gonna steal $5 from you, and later I come back and I say, I'm sorry, um, I took five bucks from you, and you're gonna say, oh, yeah, I'm, I forgive you. Well, where's my money? Well, it's the same with God. You stole something from God when you committed sin. You took some of his honor and his glory, and you have to give that back. You can do it in this life, you can do it in the next life. Do it in this life. Whatever, you know, do it in this life. It's much easier, less painful than the next life. The next life is going to be purgatory. This life is much easier. Even though, even though it might be painful what you're going through, you know, a, a sickness or losing your job or whatever, Whatever that, that you offer in this life is going to be a lot less painful than purgatory. So make as many, you know, sacrifices that you can. Offer those things, say the morning offering, so you offer every single day that you, that, that you can use it to pay for your purgatory. Um, but when you're baptized, that's none of that. It's gone. I think I told you last year a story about, this is a true story, um, the priest who had the orphanage in Mexico, when he was young, uh, when he was just newly ordained uh, and had gone to Mexico, he was chaplain at a convent, and one of the sisters from the convent, he was, had just put out the Blessed Sacrament for Adoration of the sisters, and one old sister, Sister Petra, came in and she said, told him, she said, they, they want, they they want a priest at the hospital. Um, I can't remember the man's name, so I'm just going to call him Sanchez. Um, since your Sanchez is dying, and they, this family called and they want the last sacraments. So he, you know, he puts on his stone and he goes to the hospital. Now these are uh, most, these a lot of these lots of little <coughs> private clinics, hospitals. That's what one of these was. And when he went in the door, he says, this is what you see in Mexico, you don't see in other countries. Is, you know, when you, a priest goes in and he's got a stole around his neck, everybody knows he's carrying the Blessed Sacrament, and everybody's down on their knees, and it just dropped to the floor. So, you know, you, he goes into this hospital, and everybody goes down, and the nurse says, Father, he says, what you, why are you here? And they, he says, well, somebody called. They said that Senor Sanchez wanted the Blessed Sacrament you know, needs the, the sacraments. And the doctor who was in head came out, and he, yeah, he, he heard it, and he says, I don't think Mr. Sanchez called you, and he's maybe a member of his family. He says, so, he, said, he says, you don't know who Mr. Sanchez is, do you? He said, no, I don't. He says, okay, come on back. And then he takes him back to the family, and the family's out in the hallway, and apparently Mr. Sanchez was dying of cancer, 
and he only had about three hours to live. And his family, his name was not Mr. Sanchez, it was General Sanchez. And he had been the leader of the, the, revolu the, the government troops that killed so many Cristeros in Tepatitlan. And um, so he was, you know, a, an about, um, is it Freemason? And so anyway, the, uh, he obviously did not call the priest, but the family, had, his, his son had called them. And father said to him, he says, so who called me? He says, I, he said, I did, the, the, the boy. And he says, so if your father is, you know, anti-Catholic, how is it, he says, are you Catholic? He says, yeah, I, my, mother back, my mother baptized us all um, secretly and raised us all, taught us all our catechism and raised us secretly it, um, to be Catholics. And, he, and I, he said, well, but your father doesn't want to, you know, want to be Catholic, no. Um, he says, okay, so your mother taught you how to be Catholic, so you all know how to say the rosary, right? Yes. He says, I want you to kneel down here in the hallway and start, the mother was there and like, they had like five kids. Start saying the rosary. Do not let anybody into that room and do not stop saying the rosary until I call for you. So father went into the room. General Sanchez was in the bed. He was asleep. Um, he looked really bad. And so father sat down in a chair and started saying his office. And after a little while, General Sanchez woke up, sees there's a priest sitting in his room, begins to curse and swear and all kinds of things, and, you know. And father just smiles at him and, you know, he says, you're not, you're not a Mexican. He says, no, I'm, uh, I'm an American. Uh, I'm a gringo. He says, he, uh, how, how did you know, by my accent? He said, no. He says, a Mexican priest would have left after I called him all that. But you didn't leave, so. Um, he says, why didn't you leave? He said, well, um, I hear that you're dying. And you only got about three hours to live. I'm not dying. He says, well, that's not what the doctor says. But anyway, he says, I was just, I'm just, was just curious. He said, well, what are you curious about? He says, I've never seen anybody go to hell and I just wanted to sit here and watch you die because I want you know, to see what happens when somebody goes to hell. I'm not dying, and I'm not going to go to hell. He says, oh, but you are. And he says, you know, you've, he says, think about your whole life. He says, you're, you're, you're going to go to hell. And he says, but don't, I, I, he says, I won't bother you at all. I'm just going to sit here and say my office, and you relax. And he says, you know, I, I won't bother you. So, he, the general drifts off to sleep, but he wakes up again. He sees while well, he's still sitting there. He says, "You still here?" He says, "He says it won't be much longer." Looks at the clock. He says, um, "He says, how do you know I'm going to go to hell?" He says, "Well, you, you know, you've killed a lot of people, and you know, you haven't lived the best moral life, and..." He says, there's really, it's really not an issue. He says, it's pretty, you know, cut in stone. You're going to go to hell. He says, well, unless, what do you mean unless? What's, what do you mean unless? He says, he says, you've never been baptized, have you? No, I don't believe in baptism. I don't believe in, you know, what you Catholics believe. He says, well, that would be a problem that you don't believe it. But he said, if you were baptized, he said, that takes away, you know, all the sins that you ever committed would be taken away. And um, then, yeah, you won't go to hell. But like you say, you don't believe in the Catholic Church, you don't want to be baptized, so you just, you know, take the rest. I'll just sit here and say, well, go back to sitting in some office. And after, you know, meanwhile, the general's thinking is this. So what do I have to do to be this baptized? Be baptized? Oh, he says, well, it's not quite as easy as that. He said, you would have to accept the things that the Catholic Church teaches. He said, and you said you don't want to, you know, you don't believe the things that the Catholic Church teaches, so it's not an issue. 
if so far the video stays the mark it's a little different. So what is it? What do you, he's what do you mean what is it? He says, So what do you believe? He says, Well, we believe in God. Do you believe in God? Yeah. Yeah, I believe in God. Okay. And then he went goes through each of the articles of the Catholic Church, you know, the Apostles Creed. He says, can you accept that? You know, that our Lord became man? Sure. Okay. That he died for us? <clears throat> it happened a long time ago. That's fine. Uh, anyway, anyway, he goes through the whole thing. And by the time he gets to the end, he says, okay, is that it? He says, yeah. He says, okay. He says, then do you want to be baptized? Yeah. Okay. So he goes out in the hall and he calls in the family. And he, uh, he says, <coughs> your father wants to be baptized. Well, the family was ready to fall on the floor. And so he asked the son, he said, you, would, you, would, would you be his godfather? He said, I would be honored. And he said, well, uh, uh, one or two things we have to do first. He said, um, he said I take it that you, because you, that the general and his wife are not married, really married. So he says, the first thing, he says, I need to take the mother in the hall and we'll hear her confession. Then I need to marry you two and then I will baptize him. And, and that's what he did. And within, and after he baptized him, he, you know, left and went back to the, to the, the convent. And when he went back to the convent, here's Sister Petra kneeling in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And he said, Sister, you shouldn't have been kneeling here all this time. She said, I thought you needed some help. She <laughs> recognized the name. She had recognized the name. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so baptism takes away all sins and the temporal punishment due to them. By the time he got back, the, the man was dead. He called him to say that the general had died. The family called. Him. All right, the church's laws um, concerning baptism. Um, Infants should be baptized within a week or two of birth. Why? Because their infants are exposed to so many, there's so many ways that an infant can suddenly die. You know, we have what it was called SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. You don't want something like that to happen to your baby. So you want your baby baptized as soon as possible. You also want sanctifying grace in their souls as soon as possible. The, 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 the less time between birth and baptism, the more grace. Because you've already started to increase the grace from then on. Well, what are we baptizing at birth? Pardon? What, are we, what is the priest there baptizing as the delivery is occurred? Uh, well, usually the priest isn't around when the, when the mother goes into labor and she's in the hospital. And, but it can happen, you know, right afterwards. There's nothing wrong with you calling the priest if he's available to, but uh, again most baptisms take place in the church so that they can make use of the, of the oils and there's a lot of more ceremonies than the one that the, than the simple one that you learn you know when you baptize an emergency you can baptize by pouring the water on, on, on skin and saying i baptize you in the name of the father and the son and the holy ghost but when a priest does it, he does that, but he does a lot of other things besides. So, um, like an exorcism and special blessings, <coughs> the water is a special water from that has previously been blessed. So it's, it's, it's much more involved, and so it's usually done in the church. And so as soon as the mother is able to go to church, that's, you know, within a week or so, I remember when Maria Gretti was born, her mother sent the baby with the father. And the mother could, you know, she, she couldn't get up, she didn't attend it, but she sent the baby with the father to, to, to have it baptized. Right within an hour after the baby was born, she sent the father to the church to have the baby <clears throat> baptize the child. Is it wrong for the mother to, just out of uh, concern, baptize her baby after birth? And then have another baptism. Oh, then have a conditional one. If, for example, the the baby is 
maybe sickly. No, there's, there wouldn't be anything wrong with it. The baby seems very healthy. Um, and you probably would want to postpone it, but again, if the mother has any kind of concern at all, she can, she's within her rights to do that. Um, number two is strictly against church laws to baptize a child of a non-Catholic parents without their, the, those parents' knowledge and consent, unless the child's in danger of death. Again, if the child's in danger of death, the child will not live long enough to grow up that they need to understand the Catholic faith. But if the, if the child is not in danger of death, this child will be in a non-Catholic home. And you're putting a grave obligation on the child um, and on the parents, too, because they don't know what they need to teach this child to be a Catholic. Um, so, and they may not even be living the same kind of Christian life that a Catholic lives, so you can't do that. You have to make sure that if the parents are not Catholic and the child is not in danger of death, you need their knowledge and consent. Um, Three, children who have come to the use of reason can't be baptized without their consent. Again, they, they, baptism is something you need to go into with full knowledge of what you're doing because you all have obligations. And so if you have the use of reason, the church needs your consent. So what about, the, there's two groups of people, the feeble-minded and the insane, that do not have use of reason or had use of reason and no longer have it, what about them? Well, if, if the person is feeble-minded from birth and not able to reason at all, and that's not often the case, but it it's, can be, um, most, most children who are not, who are lacking something mentally when they're born, are perfectly capable of thinking and acting in other ways, so you can teach them, in which case then they can be baptized. But if they aren't, the church considers them as, um, as a child, as a baby, and they can still be baptized, but the church will always consider them as a baby. Um, and they will never commit any mortal sins because they... They can't fulfill those obligations. You know, the, they'll, they'll never know what what is a sin or what's not a sin. Um, they be like innocent children the rest of their lives. Now, the insane, um, if they have a mo if if they go in and out of moments of clarity where there's periods of time where they actually can reason and think, then when you need to catch them in one of those periods of clarity and ask them. Um, if they are interested in being baptized, if they have the necessary dispositions. Again, you don't, the church does never want to put obligations on people that they, they can't fulfill. Um, if there's any doubt about a previous baptism of a person uh, who wishes to be baptized, then they need to receive a conditional baptism. And a conditional baptism only has a few extra words. It says, if you are not baptized, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So this puts that condition at the beginning of it. Um, baptism given by a Protestant minister is considered valid and when it's properly performed. Converts from Protestantism are usually baptized conditionally. Since it's difficult or even impossible to find out if their first baptism was done correctly. Uh, sometimes they were a baby, sometimes they were very young, sometimes you don't really know what words the minister said or if he had the right intention or if, whatever. So generally, if they are rebaptized conditionally. Uh, conditional baptism is usually administered when under other, a few other conditions. Um, if the person has or has not, um, whether the person wishes to be baptized, um, for example, 
if a person is, um, this can easily happen when an unconscious person is at the point of death. You don't know whether this person wants to be baptized or not, but they're dying. They're, they've reached the age of reason, but um, they're not likely to live. And you can't ask them because they're unconscious. You can baptize them conditionally. Um, again, well, aren't we putting an obligation up? They're not likely to live. So that obligation won't exist. And we're assuming that if they knew, if they were conscious enough that we could explain it to them, they would want to be baptized. I like, like the general. Um, we might, we also baptize conditionally whether the person is still living. For example, um, if a newborn baby doesn't, it, 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 it looks like it's, it's not living. It looks like it has no signs of life. You can baptize it conditionally. The condition is if it has still life in it, this baptism is valid. If it's not, you can't baptize a, a, something that's dead. The baptism won't work. But possibly the, the child, because lots of times we look at somebody or a baby, you know, you, how many drowning people are pulled out of the water and you think that they're dead, and yet with, with, uh, with um, CPR and artificial respiration, you can bring them back. They're not really dead. So you baptize conditionally. Um, whether the matter or form used in administering the sacrament was correct. So sometimes, yes, it was done by maybe in a Novus Ordo church. You're not sure that the matter or form was done was correct. Um, in which case, you baptize conditionally again. Now, sponsors. Sponsors are a big issue sometimes with baptism. Um, the church and the church has rules about who can be a sponsor for baptism. Sponsor baptism um, has to be a practical Catholic. The duties of the sponsor are to look upon the baptized person as his or her spiritual child. They are spiritually adopting this child, and their they their duties require them, if necessary, to take over the role of the parents in the supervision of this child's spiritual life if the parents aren't doing it or aren't doing it correctly. Um, especially their education, their spiritual education. And they have to watch over the spiritual welfare of the child. So because of these require this because of what the job entails, this is a job description, they have the church Church law makes certain requirements about sponsors. Now, I, I know of families that, you know, huge arguments because the, the <laughs> husband and the wife want so-and-so and so-and-so to be the child sponsors, and this one isn't Catholic, and this one hasn't been pa practicing their faith for a long time. And the, church, the priest says, no, well, I'm going to take my child somewhere else and have him baptized. But the priest says, no, because you can't do that. The sponsor must be baptized. They have to have reached the age of reason, and they have to have the in intention to undertake the job as sponsor. They have to know what the job description is and be willing to do that. He also has to, it can't be, be belong to any heretical or schismatic group or be excommunicated. In other words, he has to be a member of the church, he can't, and he can't have been put out of the church by any of those three reasons that we said you can be, lose your membership. You have to be at least 14 years of age, unless for some just reason the priest <coughs> allows some, someone younger. There's a, a reason why you know, we're going to let this 13-year-old this be the sponsor. Maybe there's nobody else around. Uh, maybe it's an emergency situation. I don't know. But, you know, a priest can do that. Um, the person, the sponsor, has to know the rudiments of the Catholic faith. Not necessarily everything, but they have to know the basics. Because it's going to fall to them, the, 
the edu Catholic education of this child if it's not done by the parents. <laughs> and the, the sponsor may not be the father, the mother, or married to the person being baptized. Why? Because baptism, being a sponsor in baptism, makes you connected spiritually to that child. You can't, according, when we get to matrimony, you, and I think we might have mentioned this back way back when we talked about marriage laws. You cannot, if you are, you cannot marry your godchild. It'd be the same as a mother marrying her son. You are connected spiritually to that, that child. Um, so, those are all the laws and the effects of baptism. Um, next week we'll talk about blood and <coughs> desire. Any questions? Be, it, when somebody asks you about being a sponsor for baptism, yeah, um, I don't think any of you would have a problem with it, and most of you could could handle it and deal with it. But when you go to ask somebody to be a sponsor for your children or your grandchildren, whatever, be careful. You know, make sure that they are um, they're going to be good Catholics because anything happens to you, they're. It will fall to them to make sure your children are educated as Catholic. Yes. And even if nothing happens to you, if you're not doing your job, you need to step in and say, hey, um, my godchild is not going to catechism class. I'll, I'll be picking them up on Sundays and taking them to Mass with me. Well, that leads yes. me to a question where you may not have the answer. Okay, so I have godparents, mm -hmm. and my mother and father get killed. Uh -huh. Is legally, do they become my parents? No. I have no. to do a bunch of legal stuff to. No, they, they have no legal right to it, but they, and, and that sometimes can be a problem because if the grandparents then are the next legal, have the legal right to raise the child, and the grandparents don't, aren't Catholic, and they can sometimes cause problems about the child being raised Catholic. Uh, and again, you have no legal status. You may have, if this were a Catholic country, that might be different, but it's not a Catholic country. But so you need to, in that case, you need to do the best you can about seeing that the child learns something about their faith. Um, you know, maybe sending them books, maybe offering to pay for the child's education to go to a private school where they would be you know, if the, if the grandparents are willing to do something like that, um, where you know that they will go to that kind of educate. You can maybe work around them in some way. I have them come to your house for, for a week each summer, you know, because you have a house at the beach, you know, and spend the week talking to them about the faith and, so that they're not entirely cut off from it. When they're old enough to make their own decision, um, hopefully they will, you know, come around and be able to... Uh, help them even more, but yeah, uh, the you you. But sometimes, especially in Catholic countries, sometimes you as a sponsor, their sponsor, you can step forward and maybe get um, that Very that nice. kind of that. Um, and if there is no other relation, you know, let's say the child's a total orphan, and there's no grandparent, what you can maybe you can step in and in that case and probably um, have you know get the judge to give you custody of the of the child because I I was appointed by the parents as their and their god godparent and you, know, you do have some kind of rights there um, depends on how much you know courts of law decide those kind of things bribery money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>